If you are always acting, then your work will suffer. Because our job is to come from a truthful place. And if you're always acting, you will not know what it means to be genuine. Right? And our job is to be genuine. To live truthfully as an artist, we must first live truthfully as human beings. And in order to appreciate and be sensitive to that full spectrum of the human condition, this is achieved more by listening, observing, receiving, rather than leading, presenting, and performing. So, what, what would you say is the first most important quality an actor must possess? Take that further. How would you describe what, what is the what is the ability to listen? I think it's not not just hearing. It's it's processing the information that has been given to you so that you can not regurgitate it, but apply it. Apply it with your own words. So I would even say it's the ability to receive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being able to change with new ideas. Teamwork. Nice. I think the passion and drive to do it in the first place. Okay. Yeah. Empathy. Great. Those are all essential qualities. There's no question. I could have kept going, and I don't know if I eventually, and some of these things are definitions or similar definitions. I wonder if anyone would have ever got to the point of saying that you need to have confidence. I know that sounds simplistic. And some of what we're going to talk about today is actually mining the depth of language so that it's not, yeah, we all sort of can say, okay, on the surface level, I know what confidence means. So I'm not going to ask you to sort of say, how would you define confidence? What is confidence? Yeah. An assurity in what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. An assurity in yourself that no matter what happens, it's going to be all right. Nice. Very nice. Anyone have an alternate? Um, the acceptance of all the qualities that you possess, whether they be positive or negative, you just accept who you are. Very nice. So I would take all of that, and I would say that confidence is not a strong enough word, and every now and then I'm going to go, let's go deeper, right? Um, and we'll later talk about what's a primary versus a secondary, and I would say confidence is a secondary word doesn't really activate our emotional system. It's not a get out of bed in the morning kind of word, right? And we have different emotional connections to language. So if I say the word milk, on a surface level, you all know logically what I mean, but you had varying reactions. Some of you like it, some of you don't. Some of you are lactose intolerant. Some of you remember drinking the carton that went sour and got those lumps in the mouth, right? So, we, we have the surface level of language, and then we have a deeper emotional, personal connection to language. And part of our job as actors is to mine beyond the logic level and connect to our personal connection to words and to language. So I would, my definition for confidence would be finding the state of being of I am worthy. I am worthy to stand before you. I am worthy to have my life experience shared, that I have had a unique perspective and experience and journey in this world, and therefore it is worthy to be shared with others. And that if you can't find that state of being of I am worthy as your starting place, life as an actor is going to be very challenging. So this, this may seem a little silly, but uh, I, I did say you weren't going to move, you are going to move a teeny bit. You should all stand up. Now just get it into your bodies. I want you to repeat after me. I am worthy to be here. I am worthy to be here. My life experience is worthy to be shared. My life experience is worthy to be shared. Thank you. It is, absolutely. Remember, hold on. 
because there's going to be points in your career where that will be challenged. Right? That sense of personal worth will get challenged. So we've told through history the boy meets girl story a million times. And we keep telling it if it comes from a truthful place that can incorporate your unique view of the world. So your boy meets girl story is not the one that's been told a million times. It's being told fresh and new. So a big part of what I'm going to talk about today is also how do you connect your own personal experience? How do you bring your unique view of the world to the work? Because then it has value. Then it's not stereotypical, it's not riding high, it's rooted in who you are as a human being. Now, at some point I'm happy to have this argument with you in the hallway, because if it doesn't serve you, it's fine. I don't believe you ever put on a character. You are you. You can never be anybody but you. But you are you under a set of given circumstances, under a different experience, a different background, and that will inherently change you. And for me, that means character that comes from the inside and is not put on like a costume. But if that doesn't work for you, find your own process. Right? I would say that you are all a thousand times more interesting fascinating than Hamlet. Hamlet is a bunch of words on a page. You are all living, breathing, feeling beings who have all had a unique journey in this world. So you need to embrace that, own that, share it. Your uniqueness is what makes you compelling to watch. So, assuming that we can all hold on to that sense of worth, and we may every now and then need to remind ourselves of it and revisit it. What is the most essential ability an actor has to have in order to be able to act? If you can't do this, you can't. Yeah. The ability to put oneself in those situations. Yeah. So how? What's another way of maybe defining that? In imagination. Uh, imagination is a tool that will help, but you were. What, yeah. In a way. Essential, yeah. but. You can have that and still not have this. Yeah? Vulnerability. Important. Yeah. Are there a specific word for what I was saying? Yeah, I'm just asking you to take what you were saying and maybe redefine it. So, it's the ability to live in the moment. The ability to find present tense. You can have different language around it, but it means the same thing. If you cannot live in the moment, accept it, the given circumstances as real, receive in the moment, you cannot act. You can have all the empathy in the world. You can have all the imagination. You need that ability. The whole aim of your process, and yes, it's about being grounded, and yes, it's about unlocking impulse and using your imagination and um, and pursuing your, your, your wants and your objectives and all that work, it's ultimately about shutting up that voice in your head. That's what the work is about. If that voice is talking to you in your head, you're not living in the moment. Right? And that voice will save us. Right? Like that voice is great when something goes wrong. When that voice starts self-directing and starts problem solving when we're up on stage. And we will never completely quiet that voice because we're not sociopaths, right? We know it's not real. We will always have one foot in reality knowing that it's a play or that it's a film scene. The idea is to quiet that voice as much as possible so that the voice in our head is the thoughts of the character, not ourselves self-directed. And that's what training is about, and that's what process is about. And I would, because you guys have had two years of training, I'm going to ask you, because I think this is inevitable when you really start unlocking technique and getting into training, 
for a period, that voice actually talks more. Right? Because you're trying to juggle all the lessons you're learning and all the techniques and making sure you're doing this. And make, so that for a while, that voice is going to be yapping like crazy. But it's the training and the repetitiveness of getting it into our bodies that will eventually quiet that voice. Right? When you feel disconnected or not in the moment, and we will have those moments, we all do, the danger is that we start to give over to that voice in our head, which just then becomes a vicious cycle, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not in the moment. Man, now I'm talking to myself. Now the voice is going on, and I, right? Look to your partner. The number one way to ground yourself in the moment is to look into the eyes of another human being. Get out of your head. Your partner will save you. Now, as I already alluded to, acting theory uses a lot of different terminologies. I'm probably going to introduce you to some new language today that may be different than some of the language you've used or have heard. You can use that or not. I don't think it's contradictory. Um, I think the ultimate aim of all this work, another way to look at what is process, is, is quieting that voice, but it's ultimately what is your system for unlocking impulse? To free your impulses, right? And people are different, right? You're all different. So some of you are visual, some of you are audio, some of you are kinetic. I used to think I was visual. So I would often do, build a lot of visual imagery in my head, use a lot of images. And then I realized through my training and my work that I'm actually kinetic. That I get electrical impulses in my body. And if I wait for the image, I've let that impulse go by. And so you've already probably witnessed this with each other, and I encourage you to look for it. Don't self, don't instruct each other, but start to recognize it in each other. Because you will see when actors' bodies, they have the impulse to move, but they don't let themselves. They have the impulse to speak, and then they speak a second or two later, right? And our job is in many ways to connect text and movement to impulse. And the impulse will often come faster than you think it is, and that's where it can get to work and get scary. It can feel less in control, right? But if you've done your homework, you've got to trust it, and then let the impulse lead you, and the work will be there. There are two basic schools of acting theory. Does anybody know what those two schools are? They both come from Russia. Yeah? So Stanislavski is the father of one of them. Chekhov was and Meyerhold, and some were part, in many ways, of the other. That's Michael Chekhov, not Anton. Um, so it's inside out versus outside in. Right? So Stanislavski, which then his followers developed the method, followed an inside out approach. That drawing on your sense memory, drawing on your personal experience, drawing on your own emotional system, all of this stuff that's inside of you gets drawn on and brought to the surface. And it comes from the inside out. I think in some ways we judge in North America the outside in as false or fabricated. I certainly did to some degree before I went and studied in Russia. And I would argue that as you're refining and developing and learning your own personal process, that the modern contemporary actor actually uses techniques of both. Right? And that can be as simple as allowing some kind of rage to bubble up inside of you, or using a gesture to generate the same feeling. Right? Both systems 
are designed as to unlock impulse. That's all they were ever intended to do. And some seem to think sometimes that the outside in approach is like, oh, I'm putting on something fabricated. And the true method is the internal one. They're both just different approaches to him. Yeah. Like what you did there, it just seemed like with this, the gesture, it just seemed like you were accelerating what you were already doing. It may have, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not, and I was probably doing a little bit of, there was subtle gestures in the first thing, mm -hmm. and larger gestures. Mm -hmm. So in both cases, both systems were, were kind of happening, right? Um, so part of your work is to learn to trust your impulses, know where they come from, and tr know that they will probably work faster than your brain. And if your brain is constantly trying to drive the ship, you're going to be a few beats behind. So, this means you got to be bold, you got to be brave, you got to dive in, you got to risk failure, right? But obviously, this is not chaotic. We're still, we need a framework that all of this lives in. The law of form and composition states that without a binding form, and binding all of the elements together, there is no heart. There's just a bunch of disparate elements. There's some light and some people wearing some clothes and some furniture. <laughs> form binds the elements together, resulting in heart. So, they're pretty intense in Russia. They know that actors are not robots, that it will not be exactly the same from performance to performance. They allow one millimeter of freedom in the form, which means you're, you're allowed to be one millimeter different than last night. That means the form is set. You arrive at it in a collaborative way or a dictatorial way. Depends on the kind of director you're working with. But you will arrive at a form. That form is set. You as an actor are still exploring emotionally. You will still be learning through the run. You will still be growing during the run. But the form is set. You may have some actors that go, directors go, oh, I'll try a bunch of different stuff once I'm gone. I don't care. You won't probably encounter very many of those. <laughs> <laughs> So, we have the ability to live in the moment, play spontaneously, while making thoughtful, specific choices. That's the dichotomy. And our work and our process will allow us to do what those seemingly contradictory things. So, here's a question. What do you think the difference is between professional and community actors? So I, I absolutely, 100% agree, you can have some very, very good community in emerging theater and you can find some terrible professional theater. Um, uh, let's bring it back to process. We're talking about process. So what's the difference in process? Yeah. So for a professional actor, it would be um, going through the script and figuring out all your actions, doing all the work beforehand understanding how to be in the moment, but still have the little that voice, character voice inside, and knowing that balance and working on perfecting that, whereas a non-professional actor might just read the script, learn the lines. They don't have those tools. Yeah. 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 What else? Uh, also, as a professional actor, like doing that work is your job. You have that responsibility to your director and your castmates to do that work so that it'll be there for the show, whereas if you're doing community theater, I'll start, you have another job and you're doing that for fun. Sure. Yeah. As a professional actor, generally you'll have the time. Like, a community theater actor might have access to these tools and I know 
knows them, but they might not have the time to use them because, like what he said, they have another job on top of this, they're doing this on the side. Yeah, maybe, so but right maybe, maybe they're rehearsing six, six, six hours a week for nine months. I mean, it's possible you actually end up with the same number of hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I would argue, I would welcome you to dispute, that a community theater production or a community actor rehearses until they get it right. Right? They're rehearsing and they're like, oh yeah, that was awesome. That's great. We nailed it. Let's move on. Your job is to rehearse until you can't get it wrong. It's not about getting it wrong. And that's to say, you know, stuff happens, right? Things, you know. I was doing an outdoor show once during Romeo and Juliet, and the baguette that we taunted Tybalt with got broken in half, and it stayed, didn't get cleared, and it stayed on stage. And when Juliet was weeping and wailing with the nurse, a giant raccoon just walked out, <laughs> picked up that piece of paper, and took it out, and walked off, right? <laughs> Stuff's going to happen. Like, it's out of your control. Like, yeah. everything in your control. Everything in your control. Yeah. Absolutely. So, we have a sense of that worth. Okay? And we're going to say that our passion and our commitment to pursuing this art and our respect for our partners grants us this ability to live in the moment. So then, what's next? Where do we start our work? How do we begin to work on a scene? It's helpful. <laughs> Um, so let's ask the question this way. So we'll get away from the script for a second. So what would you, what do you do in the wing before you go on? What's what's going on in your head? What's going on in your system? Yeah. Drop into your character. Like, you know, not that you're putting on the character, but like thinking about the moment before, and actually seeing, making sure you're in the right, you know, emotional state or coming. You know what you were just coming from, so you can go into that scene fully into it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Playing the moment before, whether that's audio, visual, kinetic, or as many, whatever combination works for you. Yep. Imagining where you've just been and then thinking about why you're going where you're going. Absolutely. So you're, you know, you're living in the moment before. You're not going, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be great tonight. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to hang out. <laughs> right? You're not using that voice. Right? So dropping into character, all of those things are right. So I would describe it as this. And if you want to take notes, you're welcome to. So I would get a clean piece of paper, and in the center of that piece of paper, draw a triangle. And then you can do some notes around the triangle. So we talked about finding the state of being, I am worthy. Okay? But we need that as a starting place. Right? So we're going to look at the first point of the triangle, which is state of being. So I mean, you sort of talked about you know, emotionally dropping in to where you need to be. I think some of the work that you can do is actually chart these things and name these things. Um, so when we begin with the scene, you know, when we start to rehearse, you're going to explore a lot of you know, different opportunities. Um, how do we... How do we figure out what our state of being is at the beginning of the scene? What informs that? Yeah? It's happened before. What if we get almost no information on what's happened before? Then we create it. And what would you use as your guideline to create? What happens after? Uh, yes, to be more specific. What happens in the scene? A good guideline is that, you know, we've all been advised, you know, we've all seen, you know, we've been warned about playing the end of the scene, right? So a really great just guideline in terms of 
your own starting place, maybe a bit of a rehearsal, is where do I end at this scene? And how can I start as far away from that as humanly believably possible so I have a real journey from A to B? Right? So, state of being. There's a spectrum. Okay? And for a simple language, we're going to say that the left hand is bad feelings and the right hand is good feelings. There's an entire spectrum of human experience along that rule. Okay? Who wants to name for me what you think might be the extreme right-handed state of being? The very best feeling that you can possibly have. What is that? Well, what I'm going to suggest, and I started at the beginning, is that language means different things. Yeah. This is your personal work, so you need to actually name these for yourself. And just like we talk about I am worthy, I'm going to suggest that we always name states of being with, from the place of I am. So that, what does euphoria turn your emotional system on as a word? Yeah, if it works for you. Great. I would lean more towards... I am joy, I am flying, but that's my language. You've got to find your language. What, uh, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. And remember, this is not an academic exercise. This is about language that activates you, that's evocative, that's personal, that other than our discussion, no director is ever going to go, um, can you articulate for me what state of being you're playing here? <laughs> right? So, you know, we can use, like, visceral language, sometimes people like curse language, whatever is, whatever really gets our system going. It's private and personal work, right? So what's the worst one? What's the left hand? How would you phrase it then? I am hateful? Not bad? Yeah? I am unworthy. Nice. What? Bad in what sense? Ever sense? Yeah, I mean, however you want to interpret what are good feelings versus bad feelings. I am corruption. Is it worse for you? So, we're going to get back to this in one second. But I would, well, actually, I can say, I would, you know, if, if it worked for you, if, if I am flying is, a, is, is one that would have worked, then the opposite of that might be I am falling, I am lost, um, I am loathed by society. But I would actually argue that one of the worst, the extreme left-handed, because it's the, one of the hardest ones for us to deal with, is I am ashamed. Because you got nobody else to blame but yourself. Shame is a hard one for us to deal with, and we don't often want to go there. Most other feelings can be other people's fault. You know, and the funny thing is, is, as human beings, we actually get pulled to the left side, naturally, in psychology, right? We all say we want to be happy, but we have a tendency to get pulled to the left. So if you ever think about a time when you got amazing news, and you were so excited, and everything was amazing, and then you started to worry that that feeling is going to go away, and you're starting to roll over into the left, that you find, we find it hard to sit in the right. Good information to think about with character. Right? Because as human beings, we protect ourselves. And that's a bit of what we're moving towards. Who 
in the world lives in pure primary states of being. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. You will experience almost every feeling there is in a pretty raw, visceral way by the time you are nine years old. After which point, your system will start to protect itself more. Because you don't want to feel those feelings all the time. They're uncomfortable. Right? So this is where I get into the distinction of primary versus secondary. Why do we go to the theater? Why do we watch movies? Yeah? Distracted. Distracted? Okay. Yeah? Escapism. Escapism? We're going we're to we're assume entertainment's in there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Yeah? All of those are true. But I would say, once again, let's look deeper. So what is escapism? What is being distracted? Um, I would argue that civilians, unlike us, <laughs> go to the theater to watch us experience the feelings they are not prepared to have themselves. Which means our job is to find the primary, not the second, not the safe, comfortable. So, I am angry. Primary or secondary? Secondary. Why? What do you think? Because it's kind of like encompassing a broad spectrum. Too big. Too yeah. much of a blanket term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, how would, you, what would, how would you phrase that as a primary? Stronger. Yeah. Yeah. I am really Stronger again. I would argue they're still all secondary. Yeah. yeah. Because anger comes from somewhere. Rage comes from somewhere. Where does those feelings come from? Being hurt. Fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I am I am terrified. I am lost. I am alone. I am betrayed. Those are the primaries. <laughs> We don't like to deal with, I'm betrayed, so I'm going to roll over into being pissed off. Right? That's how we as human beings deal with emotion. So the primary is more like the cause of the more, for lack of a better word, mainstream emotion? Yeah. It's the, one, it's, it's, the tr it's, the, it's the root of where the feeling comes from, but we have, over our lives, developed a more comfortable place to sit in and roll over in. And the problem is, is that secondaries can still, like, you know, I am rage, I am anger, or like, they can still be compelling to watch, but maybe a little bit generic, maybe not as interesting and as truthful as it could be in terms of mining the depth of a scene. So this method is about modern naturalism. It's about being natural. Uh, it's not about being real. Realism was a period in the late Victorian era where they tried to make everything real. They didn't make the summer extreme, so there'd be real bunnies on stage and real trees. And, right? So this is naturalism. Because right? it's not real. But please don't ever confuse natural with casual. And that's a big danger that I often see. Casual is dead. Casual means it's not important to you. It means you're living completely in secondary states. Okay. So if we as actors must live in primaries, what's the danger to our performance? Having primary feelings take over? Uh, potentially. Losing control. Mm -hmm. um, possibly, I mean, but if you're, if you've done your work, yeah. you know, 
But it's not to say that you aren't going to every now and then go to a deeper place than you imagine. But if all, the only people who live in primaries all the time are children, and we as actors live in primaries on stage, what's the danger to our performance? It can age us down. It can make us immature. So then how do we solve that? Oh, screw it, we'll just live in secondary. So primary states of being can be divided into two categories. Pure and vibrant. Pure and vibrating. So the pure one, I think, doesn't need much definition, much articulation. It's a raw, visceral experience that we would see when, the, when a child has a temper tantrum. We don't have many of them in our lives, but we will still occasionally, right? Our characters will have those pure, unadulterated, visceral emotional states. When that's not appropriate, that's when you want to get into a vibration. And I'll just do a very, very simple demonstration. So I'm nine years old, and I see a great park and a swing set, and I am pure, I see I love. Absolutely pure, I see I love, nothing else matters in the world. Right? And then, like a year or two later, now going to middle school, and I see that part, it's like, I see I love, but, you know, I'm too cool for that now, right? And that's an internal vibration, that's the push-pull. I want this, but I can't have it, or I shouldn't have it. And then before you've opened your mouth, before you've interacted with your partner, there is tension happening inside you. There is conflict. What would some people say is the definition of drama? Conflict. You are already compelled. You're already interested. Because internally, something is going on. As an audience, we may not know what it is yet. But we know something's going on in that head. So we've chosen our state of being. So we know how we feel at this given moment at the top of the sea. And our training allows us to drop into whatever that state is, in terms of where we start. So what would be the next point on the triangle? We know what we feel. What do we do? That's another definition for that. A few more. Let's unpack that. Okay. Yeah, so there's, I've talked about terminology, a lot of different words get used for this, right? So it's intention, objective, desire, want. I use the word action because it is inherently active. It is actually about doing something. To me, intention to me seems a little bit cerebral. If it works for you, great. It doesn't really get my system though. It's too intellectual. It's not an internal idea, it's about being active. So, and I actually find that one of the hardest things for actors to do is to describe or name what their action is. You know, and I think they can easily get, they can often get heady and internal about it. I actually would say there's actually quite a simple formula that can help you determine what your action is. Which is, if I had the power to write the end of the scene, my partner would do what? You're scripted one way or another. You don't have control over that. But your character has a desired outcome. So if your desired outcome is that your partner is down on their knees begging you for forgiveness, you know what your action is. You might be the one who's blubbering at the end of the scene. But we're not playing the end of the scene. You know, would they throw their arms around you and express their love? Right? Get it out of yourself. 
Our jobs to affect each other, affect our partners. We have to make our action about our partners. Now, obviously, as I just said, it's essential that we don't play the end of the scene at the beginning. We may know where it's all headed, but your character doesn't, and we certainly don't want the audience to. At its core, acting is about surprise. Right? We start to lose an audience when they know where it's going. When they can anticipate what's going to happen next. I saw an interview with an actor who once who was playing Hamlet. Um, and I thought he articulated it actually really, really well. Because Hamlet is scripted to lose. He dies, doesn't get what he wants, accidentally kills his mother, doesn't avenge the father's murder by his uncle the way he wants. And so the actor was asked in the interview, how does he handle going out there night after night and always losing everything that he holds dear in the world? You know what he said? Maybe tonight I'll win. So, if it's about getting what we want, how do we get what we want in life? As people. What do we do to get what we want? Yeah? Do you manipulate other people? Certainly. Tactics. Yeah. <laughs> One way? Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Tactics. Right? And that can be to beg, to plead, to flirt, to demand, to take. The list goes on and on and on and on. So that's what we employ to achieve our action. Have you ever heard somebody's performance be referred to as one note? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? That? They're playing the same tactic over and over again. It's not working for them. They're not getting what they want, but they're not trying anything else. No, then the audience is ahead of them. The audience knows where it's going, knows they've gotten ahead of them, right? Now, most audiences are not going to be able to articulate why they weren't moved or engaged, or but they'll just know they weren't. Um, so uh, if, along that line of that formula to try to figure out what our action is in terms of if I have the power to write the end of the scene, my partner would do what? I am trying to get this from my partner so as to achieve this, right? And that will help you start to figure out your tactics and the variety of which you can play. And obviously that's where you can do your homework and in rehearsal. You can explore a whole variety of tactics to achieve your action. Um, this, is, this is really important because while doing your personal work is essential, there is a danger. And that doesn't mean you don't do your work, but it means you be aware of the danger. And have we ever heard of like that, guy, that person was acting in a bubble? So, what does acting in a bubble mean? Yeah. You're not really giving your partner the attention. Like you're not playing off of what they're doing. You're kind of just doing your own thing in your head. Yeah. So it's you're not receiving. Yeah. Right. So that might be somebody who's just really into themselves and terrible at receiving. Or it's possible that it's somebody that did so much homework, they pre-planned their performance devoid of their partner. Right? Because while we're going to pursue tactics, while we're going to pursue our action to get what we want, there's also somebody else doing it. So they're going to affect us. Right? The result of two people pursuing difference is conflict. It's drawn. Right? The law of opposition states that sameness is uninteresting. Conflict, both within yourself and with your partner, is compelling. So it means you can make a plan, and you can try to stick to it, but your partner's going to bump you off that plan. 
And they're gonna find you're gonna find ways back to it. You're gonna recover at times, but they're gonna send you in different directions. And that's when it gets fun. So if two points of the triangle are state of being and action, uh, what's the third point on the triangle? We know what we feel. We know what we want or what we're going to do. What's missing? I would say following through is, is still, it's connected to action. Because yeah. action, you can have, you know, you can have a, a super objective or super action over the entire journey, um, an action over a given French scene, and a tactic over any given beat. Right. What's that? Outcome, doing it. So remember, that this is this is a three-dimensional world that we live in. So, there's what we feel, what we're trying to do, <laughs> image, image work fills in all the blanks. So, there's two types of images. <coughs> Concrete and metaphoric. Concrete is just like it sounds. It's just like concrete. It is real. It is in the world in front of us. When I am looking out here on stage, I'm not seeing an audience and a whole lot of chairs. I'm painting whatever picture I need to paint that is this fourth wall. It's the sunset. It's the ocean. It's the fourth wall of my room. It is whatever it needs to be. So concrete images are out here, in front of us. Metaphoric images are back here. What do you think I mean by that? Memories. Memories, dreams. Like, you know, you're on the phone sometimes, or you sometimes imagining what the person looks like on the other side of the line, or whatever, all that stuff. The imagery in our head. Yeah. So, I'll talk a little bit about this at the end. This is a modular system, so you can almost think of each point on the triangle as a dial, and you would dial this system one way for film and television, and another way for theater. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But image work, we will use a lot for both, but in different ways. Um, so in theater, we need to imagine a lot, obviously. Um, there's also a lot, you know, if we were doing classical work, there's a lot of rich imagery in Shakespeare, like the amount of image work that may need to be done. Right? Um, in film and television, we'll say we're not doing a digital, we're not from a green screen, because in the green, you know, in that kind of step work, you're going to have to imagine a lot as well. But you're on set, you know, you're shooting a scene in a bar, you're on set, you're in a bar, they've got the whole bar there, but you need to imagine a way. The camera that's here, and the boom operator, and the entire crew. So image work is about seeing what the character sees, and you as an actor do not. Or not seeing what you see, and the character doesn't. Does that make sense? So it's either imagining what you need to imagine, or imagining a way which shouldn't be there. The internet is a great resource for this kind of work. Jacques and I first started, we had used magazines and encyclopedias. Right? Um, so you can obviously use your own imagination. Some of you might have other artistic inclinations and you can draw some of this stuff, you can paint it, you can create collages. But I would, I would suggest that for some of it, 
it, you actually make it, you actually see it. But it's not all just, I'm going to imagine this. Unless you're going to take the time to imagine it in tremendous detail. Um, and I would even sometimes revisit the image work, because, you know, just like your emotional states of being, naming this stuff for yourself in a way that's really evocative to get your system going, it's eventually going to wear off. Right? Like, that memory doesn't have the power over me it did three years ago. I need to find another thing to draw. That image doesn't quite move me like it once did. So, we've made choices. We have a state of being, we have action, we have tactics and images, and now we are ready to play tennis. And that's really how I look at it. There's a ball of energy. There's only a few moments where somebody actually has the power to serve that ball. Which we call the volitional beat. Right? It's usually the first person who speaks, but not always. If I was to like just come over here and smack you across the face and you were like, hey dude, why'd you do that? I had the volitional beat. I had the power to serve that scene, even though I didn't say the first line. But often it's whoever speaks the first line. It means you can just lob it at your partner out of the blue, you can take your time before you serve. You have pure control over how you're going to start that scene. Once you fire that to your partner, you don't necessarily know how it's going to come back. And I would suggest that the person we talked about, the person that's acting in the bubble, is just standing there going, right? They're not letting themselves be affected and receive in that tennis match. Sometimes you're going to be able to slam that at your partner. Sometimes what you're going to be given is going to send you so far off kilter that you are just barely able to return it. And then every now and then you'll come, a scene will inherently often come to a grinding halt, sometimes in the middle. And I, those are called posts. And posts are sort of moments of silent communication. And it's actually good to even talk with your partner about scripting that communication. It's where somebody's laid such a big bomb in the scene that there's that moment of, did you just freaking say that? Yeah, I said it. I can't believe you said that. And then we're on. Right? But it's that moment of, what? Huh? Oh. Like we're, we're, we're actually so impacted by what happened, we're actually stunned for a moment and brought to silence. It probably then has affected our action. It may have redirected us in order to move forward. So we've done all this work. Are we ready to just dive in and act? What do they write scenes about? Would they write a scene about the 27th day? <laughs> Maybe. Then is, is the 27th day really bad? Maybe. Why? So if it's bad, how? Maybe it's the one where they decide to not date anymore. So if it was the one where they broke up, is it the 27th day? Or is it the last? Yeah, the last. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have the same impact. What would be another reason they might do a scene about the 27th day? Well, they get married. Proposal. Um, find out that they're pregnant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be good or bad. <laughs> It's either the beginning of something new, or it's the end of the relationship. Which means, it is a first, a last, or an epiphany. That's what they write scenes about. We write scenes about the icons 
of life. Now, some of those are really obvious, right? Births, deaths, sweet 16, graduation, marriage, funerals. But those are all firsts, lasts, or epiphanies. And I would argue every scene is one of those things. And it might be different things for the different characters. Right? But this is, once again, we go back to you bringing your own uniqueness to the work. If you can identify, oh, that scene is the last this, I have some personal experience with something like that. I have a better sense of what to bring to this scene. That helps you personalize the work. Oh, think about the rooms of the house you grew up in. Right? The feeling you had in your bedroom versus if you were in your parents' bedroom and you weren't supposed to versus that family room den that was super comfy and versus that living room that you were never supposed to go into unless there was company versus that terrifying attic or basement. Right? Those places are great for emotionally dropping into states of being. But there's all kinds of places in the world that you have emotional connection to. So, if you've got a scene in a restaurant, think about what this scene needs to do to you emotionally, and don't just pick some generic restaurant. Make it a personal restaurant. Same with time. Right? Time affects us in different ways. So say this 27th date is the breakup scene. It's happening at noon on a sunny day in July, but it doesn't, but you're the one getting dumped. And the sunny day in July doesn't really work for you. Right? For you, it feels like the skies have darkened and clouds have rolled in, and it feels like one of those ominous, gray, evil days. But I hear in Victoria we sometimes have for months of <laughs> Right? Now that doesn't mean, I'm not suggesting that if it's a bright sunny day you suddenly just are shivering and the, the director's like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I'm talking about how it impacts your image work and how it impacts you emotionally. Right? And maybe you do get a chill down your spine in a scene like that, despite the warmth of the sun. The biggest thing, which you all have a lot of connection with, and I don't know that we always tap into as much, is really understanding relationship. So what kind of relationships are there? I would argue there's not that many. More specific? That's one. Others? Siblings? Yeah. Romantic relationships? Yeah. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, all there is. There is mother, father. So you have mother, son, mother, daughter, father, daughter, father, son, brother, brother, sister, 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 brother, brother, sister, lover, love. Do you not fight with your friends like siblings at sometimes and love them and like lovers? It's not to say that there's necessarily in physical intimacy, yeah. but we love our friends. Yeah. And sometimes we. So think of a scene with one of your friends, and they're telling you how to, what you're doing wrong with your life. Right? So how does that scene start? That scene's in parent child, yeah. right? That's the relationship where that scene is started. And then maybe, you know, you regain some control and or tell them what's wrong with their life, so that relationship switches. Now you're in parent child. And then you find some kind of equilibrium at the end of that scene, and you're back to sibling sibling. Or you've really made up because you fought, and so you're in love. 
And I would say enemy, enemy is just a fine line on the other side of that. Have we ever had moments of enemy with our siblings? Yes. yes. We absolutely have. Once again, you know a lot personally about all of or most of these relationships. Which means, once again, your unique personal view can be brought to the work. And, uh, take it all in with an open heart. Don't try to win the college game at the expense of the real world, which means demand the training of yourselves, of the faculty, us. It's not about impressing us. If your aim is that, you will play it safe, be bold, dare yourself to risk, do not bury the embarrassing. If you ignore uncomfortable moments, you will make your performance significantly less, but still honor your boundaries. You know how far you're prepared to go. Gain real life personal experience, but not at the expense of your own instrument. Take care of yourselves and each other. And ultimately, to quote Michael Mawson, who's on a plaque in Stratford at the bar, stay light of heart and keep a smile behind the eyes.